This is Keys to the Shop, episode 253, Mindsets That Sabotage Success. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DiFurio. I'm your host for the show, and I'm really thankful to have you along today. Uh, If you haven't subscribed to the show, I would really encourage you to do so. You'll always be up to date with new episodes. Also, if you love Keys to the Shop and you get a lot out of the content, I would really love it if you'd leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Uh, during the month of December, trying to get another 50 or so reviews on iTunes and get us up to 200. That would be really awesome. And thank you so much to those of you who have already done that. It means so much to me. Um, And it really helps the visibility of the show as well, Uh, as well as uh, sharing these episodes also does that. So anyway, thanks so much. And uh, I want to let you know that Keys to the Shop also offers consulting and coaching For you and your business, whether you're just starting your first coffee shop or you have a coffee shop and you want to level up your operations, maybe you're scaling to another store and you want to improve your systems, your quality, uh, the way you manage your people, there's a lot of ways that I can help you at Keys to the Shop Consulting, either in person or over the phone. Just email me, chris at keys to the shop. Dot com And uh, we can schedule a call and talk about the details of your circumstance and see how Keys to the Shop can help you. Again, the email for Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is a fantastic specialty coffee equipment supplier. And what makes them so great is not just that they select and provide you the world's best equipment in one place, but also because they're so helpful in getting you hooked up with the right equipment for your circumstance. And that's everything from espresso machines, grinders, brewers, and even restaurant equipment like undercounter refrigeration and home brewing equipment. Also, Prima Coffee just has it all. And they also put a lot of effort into providing you with resources on their website website, prima-coffee.com, to help you learn how to brew coffee, how to use the equipment. It really shows that they're dedicated to your success in specialty coffee, and that's why I love working with them, and I'm going to bet that you're going to like working with them too. So if you're in the market for commercial equipment, you want to work with some great people, then I would highly recommend that you reach out to Prima Coffee over at prima-coffee.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Pacific Barista Series, That is the line of plant-based performance beverages designed for baristas and by baristas, pretty much. I mean, they design these beverages and then they send them out to some of the world's best baristas to bench test them before they hit the market. So when you get the soy, almond, oat, rice, coconut, or hemp, you know that it's going to be something that performs on bar, stands up to the heat from steaming, gives you amazing texture for latte art, and keeps the balance in the cup focused on the coffee. And getting the best plant-based beverages is really the best way to serve your customers that choose plant-based options at your cafe. I would really encourage you to get these in your store and try it for yourself. Let your baristas try it. You can go to their website, pacificfoodservice.com, to find out more information. Again, if you're looking to offer your customers the best in plant-based options on your menu, then I think the choice is clearly the Pacific Barista Series. Again, that website, pacificfoodservice.com. Okay, everyone. Well, today I wanted to talk with you about a few mindsets that I think are pretty common, especially in leadership when it comes to sabotaging success. And in the description of this show, I, I wrote that some of what we experience in the shop, we just chalk it up to fate or to circumstance. And I think most of the things that happen can be traced back to a mindset. Of course, our actions are guided by what we think first and how we view what's in front of us, especially how we view people in front of us. And so we're going to dive into five different mindsets that over the years I've discovered in myself and with clients and consulting clients um, and in coffee shops that I've worked for, bosses that I've had, where it just is a recurring theme. And the the benefit of being in the industry for so long is not just the wonderful uh, joint pain and uh, gray hair. It's also the um, seeing of patterns and being able to pick up on these common threads. And these mindsets, I think, are very, very common again. And I don't want you to have to go through them. Um, And chances are, don't be shocked, you might have something going on 
that resembles this in some way. And the good news is that unless it's really uh, deeply embedded in your culture and you're unwilling to change, change is possible. You can take these mindsets and you can exchange them and switch them for different things. But I would caution you that, you know, when you're looking to change your mindset, you're looking to change a habit. And that's really, really hard to do, especially if this is something that you've been doing every day. Making change in these areas is just a matter of recognizing the need for change and then making small steps towards it every day, consciously and mindfully. The last little caveat here that I'm going to say is that um, success in this case is really, you, you translate the word success to mean thriving, to mean really being all that we can be and getting out of our own way. Um, not discounting the fact that there are outside circumstances that do hold us back from time to time and maybe more than time to time. But if there is a way for us to recognize uh, and remove some uh, self-imposed obstacles, then I think it's really important for us to do that. And then we know for sure that we've done all we can. And that's what this episode is meant to do. And uh, of course, we have five mindsets here. There's probably more mindsets uh, that you can think of. And after this episode, you might get the gist and start filling in the blanks for yourself. But um, yeah, so success in this case means realizing our full potential and our business's full potential as well. So let's start with number one, and that is when we prefer image over substance. Now, what this is, is when we care more about the way our coffee shop looks, with the way our website looks, with just looks in general, than we do about the functionality of it we oftentimes will pat ourselves on the back for having beautiful spaces and beautiful branding and representation of our our brand. And then because of that satisfied feeling we have, it robs us of the energy to focus on optimization, to uh, the energy that it takes to build a functional website, a functional coffee shop with, you know, communication and equipment that works and things that are arranged the right way. And there's no more obvious, there's two actually places that you see this. There's one of the most obvious places when you have a coffee bar that's built incorrectly, and of course, what is quote unquote correct, right? But typically, we've said this on the show before, you build a bar around the menu, but most people build a bar based on what they think looks cool or what they see on their you know Pinterest board. And they don't think about what's practical for what they're actually going to be making for the humans using this, both the customer humans and the barista humans. And we try to get that design in, get that look in, but we don't focus on the functionality of it because we're more consumed with the image. And, and the second way that this shows up in the, the bar is when we're concerned with the image of having it all together, right? And we don't want to embrace the fact that there might be tension on the team. We might we don't want to embrace the fact that there might be problems in our coffee shop, in the communications, in the culture. And because we're so obsessed with an image of things are going well, this is a beautiful space, this must be a successful bar, we placate ourselves. In other words, we play ourselves, I guess, in that sense. We don't consider the deeper issues because we're stuck on the surface. You know, the way this plays out on the bar could be something like, if you like the clean lines of your bar, for instance, if you say, oh, you know, in the drawings that we put together of this bar, I like this sleek design of our bar, and it's really, uh, it's modern, it's cool, it's minimal, and you know, the baristas say, well, oh gosh, we really need a hot water tower or some kind of a, or a grinder at this place in the bar. And it's evident that if we had that, that it would just, wow, make production so much easier, make our lives so much easier. Our wrists would stop hurting. We'd stop crying ourselves to sleep. But management says it would ruin the lines of the coffee bar, like the Instagram ability of the coffee bar because we've got like a, a brewer or a grinder or a tower there and it ruins the image. Now, if you found yourself worrying about the aesthetics of the bar because of a piece of equipment look um, and you don't like and it's ugly, then you might be in this place of having to assess what you're actually there to do. 
chances are most people are not going to really care as much about the lines of your coffee bar as you are. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need to worry about style. I'm not saying that you should make a place that just does, throws style to the wind. But there is a point at which adherence to style becomes tyranny, and it holds back progress because what you need to do is maybe take a hit on the style side in order to gain a lot on the functionality side. So yeah, we have to have style, but the mindset that we should adopt is that style submits to the health and functionality of our business. So substance is the mindset that we should be after. How does this thing function? Who is it for? Is it working? And when push comes to shove, what's going to give first? And I think it really should be uh, you know, losing some style points in order to win a lot more points in service and experience. Now, the next thing here, uh, two, number two, I guess, is fast versus right. Now, there's a few ways that you can see this mindset play out. Well, one of the ways is that you can see this, obviously, with the way you create things. So if you really want people to have a great coffee experience, you would focus on making things fast. Now, you can make things fast and right, but sometimes we make things fast and inaccurately in order to serve the need to be fast. And when we don't balance that with precision, then we're going to naturally cut corners and we're going to have delivered a superior um, time experience, but we're not going to deliver a superior overall experience. And so let's take that to another level here and talk about the way that we act with how we curate what our coffee bars carry and the decisions that we make for our coffee bars as they develop. Because when you start a coffee bar, there is just, it's not going to be the same at year four as it was in year one. Now, part of that is just the natural evolution of your community interacting with the baristas and your response to them. But other parts of that is you sort of, you know, shoehorning a bunch of stuff into the shop that may or may not fit. And when you're concerned with, uh, you know, just keeping up with the trends, for example, and responding super quick without assessing whether or not it's right for you, and write for your community. And you think, I, I really love this, um, you know, what is it that, uh, like unicorn frappuccino? Like you may really love that. You, you think it's really cool. Maybe it's not right for your shop. You can't just use your shop as uh, a playground for your whimsical ideas. It's got to be something that is created for your community and fits in with what's actually desired by your customers and is actually doable by your staff. But oftentimes what happens is, especially when you go to a trade show or something, which you know I will encourage you to go to the tra a trade show all the time. Uh, I love Coffee Fest uh, and I've worked for them for a long time. But one of the things though that I tell people that go to Coffee Fest is like you have a bag full of shiny pamphlets and brochures. That does not mean that you need to do all of this stuff. Like right now it might seem very convincing because you just got done talking to a bunch of salespeople and that's kind of their job. And so is the job of the person who printed that material. But now the work is you've got this stuff in your hand. Now you've got to figure out if it's right for you. And too often owners, because they have the power to do it, will produce uh, a new menu item with absolutely no discussion no real critical assessment of whether it's right. They just want to be fast. They don't want to miss out on the nitro trend or the unicorn frappuccino trend or the uh, ener energy syrup trend. And the question of whether this is right or not really doesn't make it into the conversation. So this mindset of being fast and speed, when it's out of balance with whether it's right or not or accurate or not, wreaks havoc. And how it sabotages your success is it creates an unknown element that affects your sales. So if you make a misstep in how you responded to a trend in the market and you just kind of you know, hastily put it in, you might be able to track some of how it affects your sales, but you can't really track necessarily the confidence that people have in your store that you may have just eroded. The same thing is true for your staff, where you want your staff to be able to know that you have their best interest in mind and you're going to prepare them for success and all of those things. And you're focused on what's right, not necessarily what's fast, what's now, what's trending. Um, so a few different ways to think about this mindset of fast versus right. In the end, uh, you have to kind of marry the two. 
You need to be responsive to the market, but only to the degree that what the market is offering is actually helpful and right to your community. Just like you need to make a drink fast, but only if you can also make it well and accurately for the customer. So that's the second thing. Now, thirdly, let's talk about perfect versus good. Now, this is kind of a trope. Perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, but it's actually true in a lot of cases. We hold perfection up in our minds as a standard, even when we know that perfection is impossible. The reason why I think we do this is because we think that if we don't give ourselves this lofty goal of perfect of perfection, that we're just going to let ourselves off the hook and we're just gonna, you know, take give ourselves an inch, we take a mile, that kind of thing. So we say, no, it has to be perfect. Kind of like we say, oh, the launch date of my coffee shop is, you know, October 2nd, <laughs> you know, whatever. And you know in the back of your mind, it's not, it might not be that day and life happens. And perfection is similar in that we wouldn't even really know how to assess perfection because we're so used to pursuing it. And the way you pursue perfection is by finding imperfections and eliminating them. Now, how are we supposed to recognize perfection when it happens if all we're focusing on is imperfections, right? So let's talk about this a little bit. It kind of flows from the last point about uh, something being right and appropriate. You know, being right, something being right can turn toxic if it turns into, it has to be just right, you know, just perfect. Nothing is ever just perfect. I would encourage you to just think about your progress as higher degrees of imperfection. I think that should be our aim. So let's talk about something that happens on coffee bars where, you know, somebody wants to produce a manual. Somebody wants to produce a policy or a checklist or um, a menu for a signature beverage. Um, and they do it in such a way that they they just have to get it just right. They have to have the logo at a certain place on the menu. They got to, you know, get the right font. They have to get the right frame, uh, all this stuff. And meanwhile, people who need it don't have it. And this is not, again, like the style section, this is not a call for you to say, well, just whatever, put it on a scrap piece of paper and post it on the wall. There's a point at which something is done, and it's done to the point where it's actually going to be useful, and then you can improve it over time. So it sounds ridiculous to say, but if like you're not the biggest fan of left-corrected text on your manuals and you want everything center-corrected or whatever, we're always going to find something that we can improve. That should not delay our ability to install something that is good and useful and serves the group, serves the baristas. Man, they need an updated checklist. And it's easy to just update the checklist, not make a big production out of it, you know? And that would be more useful than creating like a uh, manual 2.0 where everything is being reassessed. Just go one at a time and put in the good and improve it over time. You don't have to get it absolutely perfect and delay the delivery of the resource. I mean, this is more than just inanimate objects. This is people we're talking about here. People that need communication, they need leadership, they need um, resources. And when we let the perfect be the enemy of the good, then things don't make it into play that really could be helpful and help people avoid confusion and you know help them feel more secure and resourced as employees. And like all of these, this is not a call to abandon a standard, but maybe it's a call to examine if you've taken this a little bit too far and if it hinders the purpose behind what it is you're doing, um, letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Again, higher degrees of imperfection is a great way to look at uh, your your rules and policies and checklists and resources and tools and all that stuff, right? Um, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Now, this podcast is a great example of that because I like to go back to the first episodes and listen to how they were produced and the sound quality. And I know that I have better sound quality today than I did back then. And back then, I you know had access to great podcasts back then. You know, like I listened to great podcasts. I knew that my audio wasn't exactly where I wanted it to be, but I wasn't going to delay the launch of the podcast just because of that. So higher degrees of imperfection, that will solve the tension between perfect versus good. Now, another mindset here, number four, is the mindset of operating for power versus from power. Let me explain this a little bit. 
we can tend to try to gain power for ourselves in a pursuit of finding control. Inevitably, this means that people feel controlled, people feel that you're power hungry, and as a leader, you already have power. It's inherited. It's inherent within your role. And to pursue power, to focus on it, to try to gain it, is going to, it's overkill, honestly. You know, we struggle in coffee shops. Business is full of problems. We've got COVID this year that is just wreaking havoc and the challenges abound. So it's understandable why we would make a bid for this and operate from the mindset that we have to gain power and not really recognize the power that we already have. So we underestimate how much power we actually possess to create solutions for situations, and the idea that we don't need to strive for something that we already have. It's a whole different way of thinking. We're not operating for power, operating from an already existing power. Now, that may sound a little woo-woo or whatever, but um, I firmly believe that when you are made a manager, when you're a trainer, an owner, there is a power and authority that comes with that. <laughs> you know, it's it's in the air. We talk about it so much on the show. And now we have a responsibility to embrace that, not to try to, you know, hoard it and gain more. You know, when we operate from a, a place of trying to gain more power, we put the solutions outside of our, ourselves and we don't recognize the things that might be right in front of our face. And when we hoard power also, it creates a backlog of distribution of power, which is why we have this authority in the first place. It's not for us. It's for everybody else. This is our, we're a distribution center. That's what people who hold power should be. Um, we are supposed to give it away, use it for the good of others. And when we don't do that, and when we're fearful about losing it and we hoard it, it creates animosity. And so we need to operate from the perspective that we have the power that we need and which is spend our energy curating and directing where and how it's used and given away and distributed rather than worrying about how we're going to maintain it. When you can do this, when you can utilize what is already there, it will grow into something much healthier and it will empower others. But when you are obsessed with operating for power, then people become disillusioned, people become disempowered, and you know we just get the inevitable and common thing of high turnover and toxic relationships and all of the stuff that we hate to see in coffee shops. So I'd really encourage you with this to take the opportunity and think about, do you have some insecurities with how you view your authority? Do you have some insecurities that cause you to seek power rather than seek to use the power that you already have? When you can balance that mindset, when you can shift over to that generous mindset, then you're going to see a world open up to you that didn't open up before. And it's a wonderful thing, I can tell you. Um, now the last mindset of the five that we're talking about today is when we operate for approval versus operating for the service of others. Let me say that again. We're operating for approval versus operating for service or for the service of others. This is something that's a bit like the perfection thing. It, it, approval is. You know that saying that says, you know, people don't think about you as much as you think they do? Yeah, it is so true. And yet we struggle so much to find validation through the approval of those often that have no consequence to our daily lives. Most people don't think about you so much so to be able to give you the kind of approval you think that you need. And so we become obsessed with you know, winning the, our city papers, top, you know, three coffee bars in, you know, fill in the blank city. You know, we want to be top 10 in the country, you know, the best coffee shops in every, you know, all 50 states. Uh, we want to be mentioned in articles and get shout outs on Instagram and we want awards and all these things. I'll tell you, they should not make you feel, I don't think, like you've arrived. I will tell you that most producers of those lists have absolutely no idea about anything about coffee, like when they produce the top coffee shops in all 50 states. The secret is, the real secret is, you have to take that as a marketing opportunity and say, oh my gosh, we're so honored to be 
in this list. It's an m- amazing thing. USA Today said this, or you know, um, Salon.com said whatever. It's you know, more often than not, some intern, and you know, God bless them, they are given an assignment to do this, and it's as easy as a Google search <laughs> and choosing. A, you think they've been to all of these coffee shops? They don't know these shops as well as the customers do, and there's no way that we believe that we are actually the number one coffee joint in our state based on this assessment. <laughs> but we want to believe it. You know, we we feel validated. Oh my gosh, it's a marketing thing, and you have to you, and you have to use it that way. That's what they're really good for. But it is not a validation or a testament to your success necessarily. What is a testament to your success is the admiration, praise, and support of the people that you serve. That includes your staff and your customers, okay? So we serve them. We should be looking for signs of success through our service to those we serve. Uh, Are we doing our best to serve our staff? Are we doing our best to serve our customers? What does our best look like? We, or are we obsessed about that? Like, how can we do better? What can, what can we do to, you know, be more hospitable, to get greater, better coffee, and to make working here even more of a joy? When those are your pursuits, you might get more accolades because of that, as a byproduct of that. But your mindset is so focused on what you're doing there that you're not going to see that as the ultimate validation. You're not pursuing those approvals. You might see it as the ultimate validation if your focus was the top 10 or getting mentioned in a national magazine and stuff like that. You know, in Louisville, they have a a Reader's Choice Award for the local paper, and sometimes you scratch your head and you're like, well, how did they get that? Well, the readers voted, but how many readers? Is it every person that gets coffee in the city of Louisville? Of course not. If you're focused on the right thing, you're more upset maybe at the loss of a marketing opportunity than you are at this meaning that you're not number one. We can't be so fragile. If you focus on approval from outside of your area of influence, your staff and your customers, then your stability is going to be threatened. It's going to be an up and down existence, more so than it already is. And that's just not a healthy way to go about it, you know? Again, ask yourself the question, are we doing our best to serve our staff and our customers well? If the answer is yes, and if that's your focus, then your security is not going to be threatened when you're not selected as the top cafe. And or when some other cafe is selected that you don't think deserves it or whatever, because you're too focused on what you're doing, right? And who you're serving. Maybe the rule should be the farther a thing is away from you, the less it matters, if the praise originates from across the ocean, um, you know, and the people have never really been to your cafe, take it with a grain of salt. But if the praise originates from a regular customer who's been coming to your shop for years, three days a week, and is, you know, bringing friends and family into the shop, and they just speak really glowingly of you, that means so much more. And being able to find life from those types of things is only possible if you're focused on operating from service and not for approval. You're operating to serve them. You find your approval in that. It's a byproduct of it. But when we reverse it, that's when we get ourselves in trouble. So as we said in the beginning here, our mindset really sets us up for taking actions that either lead to success and thriving, or they will sabotage success and thriving. And by uh, talking about some of these, I hope that we've, you know, maybe covered some stuff that you found yourself engaging in, and you can start to head down the right path and adjust some of these mindsets to a healthier balance and disposition. And I have been in the mindsets of all of these things multiple times throughout my career. And if it's not me who has this mindset, I've seen it happen in you know my clients' lives, in the lives of shops that I've I've worked for. And I can tell you that these are very common, but they don't have to be. It's our decision to determine how we're going to think, and that will determine how we act, and that will determine how we thrive. So I hope that this episode was helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, any feedback about this episode or any episodes on Keys to the Shop, uh, give me a shout. You just email me, chris at keystothoshop.com is the email. You can also reach out to me through that email to talk about uh, working with Keys to the Shop Consulting. Again, that's chris at keystothoshop.com.
www.thebigbibleshow.com. And uh, that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have an amazing week. And as always, I truly hope that this episode has given you keys to the shop. Thank you.